you have your Bible with you today, if you would open with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, we're going to look together at verse 1 through verse 23. Of course, we've been walking through Matthew's gospel. It's a series we've called Follow Me, because what we find in Matthew's gospel is not only Jesus' call to follow, but what it looks like to follow. And so we see it as we walk through the gospel in seeing how Jesus leads us along. But then also in the midst of our lives, the surrender that's required, and the way that our life then looks when we are surrendered to Jesus, we also see what it looks like when there are those who say they're surrendered to Christ and yet are not. And so in Matthew's gospel this morning, we look at the characteristics of the heart. As a kid, I was gripped by the movie The Wizard of Oz, right? I remember watching it lots of different times. And one of the things about it that always, I guess, you know, was one of my favorite parts was when Dorothy encounters the Tin Man. You remember his dilemma? Well, I mean, at first it starts, he can't move. That's a pretty big problem. But eventually it's discovered that the Tin Man just wants a what? He wants a heart, right? Eventually he gets a heart. But as we think about that, we realize that our heart is pretty important to the exercise of our life, right? Everything that we do in some way kind of goes back to our hearts. It's probably why we can point to pop culture and there are so many different songs like Don't Go Break In My Heart, Total Eclipse of the Heart, Unbreak My Heart, and on and on and on. Right? You maybe come up with a few yourself. Well, why is the heart such an emphasis? Why is it so much of a focus? Why do we think about it so often? It's because it's the source of where our emotions flow from, right? It's really where who we are is kind of set. It's the center of our soul, if you will. And so the heart is important. And as we consider following Christ, it is that our heart is where all of that comes from. A heart devoted to Christ is going to demonstrate a life or demonstrate action consistent with who Jesus calls us to be. Now that doesn't mean there won't be moments of difficulty, that there won't be any moments of failure, because there certainly will be. Right? But the heart, even when we stumble, the heart is still devoted to the Lord. And so what we see this morning as we look at the passage is that our hearts can be an obstacle to submitting to the word of God. In fact, our hearts can be in a place that is suspect when it comes to following after Jesus. And so we need to take care and be very careful that our hearts are in the right place, that our hearts are yielded and devoted to Christ. Because they will be an obstacle if we aren't careful. And so what Jesus is doing in the passage this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 through verse 23, is he's showing us four reactions to the word of God. Or or four responses, if you will, concerning receiving God's word. And so look with me, if you would, in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 1. We'll read through verse 23 together. One of our core values is that we are committed to sound doctrine. When we talk about sound doctrine, we are talking about the word of God. And so each week we use it. And so uh, if you don't have a copy of God's word, uh, we would hope that you would find one in the pew or in the chair. If you're sitting in a chair, um, take that copy of God's word. Let it be our gift to you. Uh, But this morning we would love for you to follow with us in Matthew's gospel starting in verse 1. So let's read together. It says, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. 
Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see. And your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. As we look at this passage, we come face to face with a way that Jesus really liked to teach. He taught them in parables. Now a parable is basically a story. It's a story that's meant to incite spiritual understanding in its hearers, right? Jesus used them in order to to communicate a message that Jesus could have said outright and they may or may not have understood it. But by giving them the story, he drew them in. He, He allowed them to be able to start interacting with the characters. And as they did, they began to see that it revealed a truth about themselves about their own hearts, about where they were. And so a way we might describe it is that it's an earthly message with a heavenly meaning. And what Jesus was doing as he gave these parables, and we'll look at many other ones as we go along in Matthew's gospel in the chapters that follow, chapter 13, but Jesus is using parables to help advance their understanding of not only who Jesus is and what it looks like to follow him, but about what faithfulness and what's coming and about what God is doing, all right, Jesus uses those parables to advance their understanding, right, of things of the kingdom, of the word of God. And so these parables are instructive to us. They help us to be able to see what it looks like to follow after Jesus and to do that faithfully. And so as we jump into the passage, we, we're going to look at verse uh, 1 through verse 9 and look particularly at how Jesus lays this out and looking at the characters and what he says about these different aspects in the midst of this story. But we can't miss the interaction that Jesus has. Right, that's what happens in verse 10 through the end of it. Now, he gives in verse 18 through verse 23 the explanation of the parable. And it's very helpful to have that, right? We get Jesus' own words about what all of this in verse 1 through verse 9 means. But here, Jesus is asked a question in verse 10. He says, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus' answer is that some of them don't understand. Now, remember that in context, this is happening immediately after what we looked at last week. And that was all about surrender. 
and about the Pharisees' unwillingness to surrender. And so here, Jesus is revealing that it is a fulfillment of prophecy that they would even have the response that they have, that they would be seeing but not really seeing, right? They would hear, but they wouldn't really hear. That, that in the midst of it, there was something that was happening where they were not perceiving what was going on, or at least even in seeing it, that they wouldn't turn. That's the prophecy that he gives in verse 14. He says, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. He says, for this people's heart has grown dull. He's talking about the Pharisees and the others that refused to believe in who he was. But notice what it centers around. Their hearts have grown dull. With their ears, they can barely hear as a result of a heart that is dull. With their eyes, they have closed them because their heart is dull. So if they would have had understanding, then they would have seen with their eyes and heard with their ears and understood with their hearts, and they would have what? They would have turned. They would have repented. That's an evidence that we must see. And he says, and I would heal them. He says, I would change them. And so here, as we look at this, Jesus says, blessed to them, those that are hearing and understanding, those that are his followers who he's speaking to here. He says, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see. Meaning what we've talked about, that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the prophecy that had come before. Many longed to see the Messiah come. He was there. They acknowledged it, at least the ones who he's talking to here. He said, many longed to see what you see, but they did not get to see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And now Jesus is almost pronouncing an indictment against the Pharisees because of the dullness of their hearts, their unwillingness to believe in who he is. And so as we think about that, we think about our own responses, our own reactions. As we think about this parable, it should incite spiritual understanding in us because just as much as it reveals where they were, it reveals where we might be. It shows us where we certainly should be and points out to us what faithfulness in that regard looks like. And so as we jump into the different parts of of the passage, the first thing we see is the sower and the seed. All right, here are the the, the players, if you will, in the midst of this. Well, as we look at the sower, the sower is certainly Jesus in this particular context. In the immediate aspect of it, it is that Jesus is the one bringing the word. He's, He's transmitting, if you will, God's word. He's scattering it out to those who would hear it. But I want you to also understand that as we break this parable down and we might run it into our modern context and think about applying it, the sower is anyone who brings and gives the word of God, anyone who scatters the seed. And so as we think about that today, I could be the sower because I'm giving you the word of God. Jesus certainly in the context was the one who was giving God's word to them and they weren't receiving it. But in the same way, anyone who brings the gospel message is one who sows the seed. And so as we think about that, the sower is Jesus, but that indicates to us what we've already said, the seed is the gospel of the kingdom. The seed that he sows is the word of God. And Jesus himself is the one who tells us what this is. And so as we look at it and look at the response to the word, because really that's what we're starting to talk about. As we see these different uh, soils, the the seeds scattered on them, the soil that we see represents people's hearts. And it represents a condition of heart that they have. And so there's the sower and the seed, but there's also the ground. And the characteristics of the ground matter in this context. And so first we see that there is the path. And when he talks about a path, we, we might take that to mean a road, right? You've probably seen this before. If you've ever walked on a trail that's been kind of worn out and nothing's growing on it because people walk over it all of the time. And, and so nothing grows on it. But the other characteristic of it is typically the soil is, is pretty hard, right? And that's because people step on it and and trample it down, and and so it ends up packing in. 
And so you begin to get the picture of that kind of soil. And if a seed were sown on it, you see how Jesus describes that. He said some fell along the path in verse 4. And he said the birds came and devoured them. Right? It's that the seed is immediately snatched away. It's immediately taken away because if it's fallen on the path, it, it doesn't dig in. There's nothing hiding it. There's, there's nothing keeping it uh, from the birds of the air to come and just take it and, and grab it away. Right? You can even bury seeds sometimes in your garden and the birds or other animals come and get it, right? So here as we start talking about that, though, this characteristic of the path begins to show us the, the heart of an individual. And it's a hard-hearted person. Right? It's a person whose heart has been so hardened that the seed, when it comes, it, it in essence just bounces right off of it. It's not received, it's, it's not implanted. And so when we think about it in that, it has no capacity for the seed to be received and thus the seed is rejected. And so the path as the seed falls on it, Jesus says the birds come and carry it away, devours that seed and it is gone. And so the seed that falls on the path is rejected, but it's because of the nature of the path, the nature of the heart. The next one that we see is the rocky ground, right? So it's not that it's a, a path, it's, it's rocky, so it's, it's ground that is not prepared, ground that's not ready to receive a seed. And here what Jesus says is that other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up. But since they had no depth of soil, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. Since they had no root, they withered away. And so here we look at it that the soil depth is not sufficient except to sprout the seed very quickly, but the seed is not able to actually root into the ground. There's no sufficient root to sustain it, and so it goes away, right? It is ultimately withered because it has nothing to, to pour into, nothing to dig into, nothing to root itself into. And so we might describe this heart or this individual as one who receives the word with joy, right? In fact, Jesus says that. As we look a little bit further on, he says that in verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, that's the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, endures for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. There's no root, nothing to sustain it. And so the rocky ground or a heart consistent with the rocky ground might give joy at hearing the word. But the word is not received with root to sustain it for any amount of time. And thus the seed then is rejected, withers away. Next we see the thorn infested soil. It's received as with the rocky ground. But what Jesus describes about this particular soil in verse 7, he says when it fell among the thorns, the thorns grew up and choked them. Right, now we get that picture that, that it is that you've got a beautiful plant that's trying to grow up and yet these thorns or weeds or whatever are just growing in and choking out the plants that you actually want to grow there. Jesus describes it as the cares and concerns of the world that are choking out this soil. And so it is that, verse 22, Jesus describes that. It's the one who, he says, hears the word. Uh, excuse me, verse 23, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 22, we were right. The one who hears the word, but then he says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches are what choke it out. And so as we think about the rocky ground and the thorn infested soil, I, I want you to hear something. It, it is that there is something that looks like belief, yet is not. Right, we've talked about this before and, and I think we have to say it again and we have to take a little bit of time to describe it because we can look and, and even know who Jesus is and yet not surrender our hearts. We can see the gospel message and we can even have a, a firm grip on what the gospel tells us about ourselves and about the world and yet not surrender our hearts. Now truly in the end, it is the Holy Spirit that works in us the Holy Spirit who changes us, 
the Holy Spirit who creates capacity for the word to be received. But in the midst of this, we must weigh our hearts because you notice what he says here. <clears throat> now, he's not saying, as we talk about seed withering away, that it's just that a person has difficulty when tribulation comes or when persecution happens. No, it says he falls away. It means he goes away never to return, never to come back. In particular, we look a little bit further and we see that the one, uh, the, the seed that fell among thorns and, and grows up there but is choked out by the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and it proves unfruitful. It's meaning that there is nothing there to be seen that shows belief. And so what we have to acknowledge is that a person can hear God's word, see the gospel and say, that's great, but never surrender. The word is not received and implanted. The word is just there. And they acknowledge it with joy. This is great. This is tremendous. But yet they never surrender their lives to Jesus. Never give themselves to him. And that's the picture that Jesus is describing for us because as he goes into the final soil, the good soil, he says that it is received, but notice the difference. He said the seed fell on good soil and it produced grain. Right, meaning it, it grew up and it was sustained enough and thriving enough, not just that it was able to remain and not wither away or not be choked out. It grew up and it was enough to remain to what? To bear fruit, to demonstrate that it had yielded in that heart. He even describes the nature. It says some was a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Well, what it's talking about, and I think what Jesus is saying to us there is, is hey, we don't know exactly how much fruit's going to be seen in that life. And, and there's going to be different evidences in different people's lives of the amount of fruit. And some lives will show tremendous fruit. Some will maybe show less. But don't miss what Jesus is saying is that life is going to show fruit. It's going to be evident. And so that's the picture. In fact, don't miss what Jesus said just in the passage before this one that we looked at. Go back one chapter really quickly to chapter 12 in verse 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. Guess what they were not demonstrating? They were not demonstrating fruit in keeping with repentance. What Jesus is noting here for his followers, what he's noting for his disciples is the importance that in our lives, fruit is shown and fruit is seen. Now, let me add a caveat and then we're going to jump into some application from this. This does not mean perfection. It's not saying that it means we're never going to sin again. Right? You can't say, well, that person has sin in their life, so that means they're not bearing fruit. No, because even our repentance can be fruit in keeping with repentance. Do you get that? Right? It's the overall nature and condition of the heart. Can a heart yielded to God still sin? Yes, it can. But what does it do when it sins? It runs to repentance. Right? Remember our series uh, in uh, looking at David's life a couple of summers ago. Right? We, we looked at David and what do we acknowledge about him? We acknowledge the truth that David in the midst of his life sinned and, and grievously sinned. And we look at that and that he was able to, to do that shows us something, right? But what did he do when he sinned, right? He demonstrated, right, repentance. He demonstrated the overwhelming grief of heart that comes with knowing he had failed God. Knowing that he had gone against God. God's will, knowing that he had done all of these things. And where does he go? He goes to his knees before the Lord. That is a heart in keeping with repentance. And that's what we should be showing in the midst of our lives. It should be that fruit is seen. Fruit is known. And so as we begin to think about that, the takeaways for us, the heart, it's all about our heart. And so first, what we see is that the heart's condition plays a vital role in receiving God's word and living out 
God's word. Hearing the gospel of the kingdom and receiving the gospel of the kingdom and then living out the gospel of the kingdom. Believing sound doctrine and then living out sound doctrine. Being committed to sound doctrine. Not only the reality that we would have it as a church and make it important, but that in our individual lives, what we would demonstrate from start to finish is that we love God's word, we treasure God's word, we live out God's word because we love God. And so our heart's condition plays a vital role in this. The problem of understanding is one that we have to reckon with. That's what Jesus acknowledges. And we looked at just a moment ago in the verses that we look at in verse 10 through verse 17, right? It was their understanding that was at issue. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, so they were dismissing away all of the miracles he was doing, all of the fulfillment of prophecy that was evident, right? And so what Jesus describes is that they had become dull Of what? Of heart. It wasn't a problem that, well, they just didn't happen to be there when Jesus did that particular thing. It's not that that they were blind in sight so they couldn't really see what was going on. Jesus points this all back to a spiritual reality. And the spiritual reality that's present there is the dullness of their heart. Either an unwillingness to see and believe or that it was hidden from them. In some way. Yet in the end, they had not believed. They were not receiving Christ as Lord. In fact, even dismissing away the things that he was doing. There's a problem with understanding. And so where the Pharisees could say that they they knew the word, there was no fruit from that being demonstrated in their lives. They had ritual that they were keeping up with and ritual that was important to them, but it was revealed that their heart was not seeking to honor God in the midst of it, they did not change. And so knowing the word of God means that it then informs our hearts, it guides us, but don't miss the reality that it must change us. And the change comes as we are willing to to believe it and follow it. And so there's a problem with our understanding. And if there is, we must pray. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of the Lord who gives to all without reproach. If you're having trouble following with this, then ask God for understanding. Lord, help me. And the promise that we get there is that he will. So we must understand, meaning that our hearts must perceive, see, know. And when it does... We must follow through. But we can't also miss that there is an active opposition that's happening. Right? Don't miss what Jesus says here. As we look at at the word being snatched away. Right? It says in verse 18 and 19. Here then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes, snatches away what has been sown in his heart. There is an active opposition that's going on. In fact, Paul acknowledges this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where he tells us that the God of this age, little g, meaning Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ. There's an active opposition blinding their hearts and minds, seeking to keep them from the truth. Jesus describes the, the devil as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. In fact, he tells Peter, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, he tells Peter. He tells him, I've prayed for you. So here we look and we see that there's opposition happening in the midst of this. And so I think sometimes we just think it's as simple as, well, I sowed the seed. Why didn't they believe? But realize there's an active enemy working against us. There's an active enemy seeking to tempt us even that we would not show. This in the midst of our own hearts, that we would not understand, and then that seed would be taken away. And so we must understand, and with the reckoning and realization that there's active opposition, we must fortify ourselves against it. But the biggest question that comes from this as we think about the heart's role in the midst of all of this is how ready are you to receive the Word of God? What would you describe? the condition of your own heart as. 
might be a litmus test that we would give. What, what do you do when you hear the word of God says this? Do you say, yes, I'll follow? Do you say, no, I won't? Or do you hedge? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Let me, let me study that some more. Let me find a commentary, see what it tells me. Right now, I'm not telling you don't study commentaries. I'm not telling you don't dig into God's word to see what is there. But I'm telling you that when you know what it says, don't try to explain it away. Right? Don't try to, to say, oh, well, there'll be another day to do that. Because often what we do, we see exactly what God's word says. Whether it's realizing that Jesus is Lord or if we followed Jesus and in the midst of our life, we realize something about it. And even the calling to forsake the treasures of this world, to forsake the wisdom of this world. We might look at all of that and know that it's true, know that we should follow it, and yet still say, no, I don't think I'm going to. And that's a lack of submission and a lack of surrender. When we err, we run to repentance. That's what the word calls us to do. So we are following the word when we do that. So I'm not telling you it's about whether you're, you're perfect or not, whether you've never sinned or not. That's not the issue in the midst of this. What's at heart is whether we are submitted to God's word that when it tells us follow this way, do this thing that we're willing to say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. And not say, well, Lord, I need more clarification. Or, Lord, I'll, I'll do that one day. It's not that I'm not willing to ever, but I'm not willing to now. Right? We have to be careful that we're following after Jesus. So what do you do when the word speaks? Soil that is good for growing is soil that's prepared. I begin to think about that in, in the midst of uh, the small amount of gardening that I've ever done in the midst of my life, um, albeit without tons of success, right? But if uh, you just walked out in your backyard and took a handful of tomato seeds and just threw them out there, how successful do you expect that you would be? I mean, you might get a couple of plants to sprout up and grow, Maybe at some point you'll, you'll get some, some fruit out of that, right? But I think if we're honest, if we want fruit, I mean, if we want tomatoes, then we're going to take the time to actually cultivate the soil. We're, we're going to prepare a place to plant them and, and we're going to set that up so that the conditions are right and that everything is, is ready. And so my challenge to you would be if we want our lives to demonstrate the glory of God, then we must prepare our hearts, right? A heart that is ready to receive God's word and live out God's word is a heart that's going to bear fruit. Now to be certain, the Holy Spirit brings the growth. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals and convicts and makes us aware of truth. And so we need to be aware of that in our life. But, but brothers and sisters, there are activities and actions that we can practice that make us ready to hear God's word, make us ready to receive God's word and live out God's word so that we might bear fruit. And yet the equivalent for a lot of people is the way that they're living their lives is just like what I said. They're walking out and just throwing tomato seeds in their backyard and walking away and says, all right, I hope I get some tomatoes. That's how we live our lives sometimes. We just throw it out in the backyard and say, all right, I hope Jesus does some stuff with that. We just walk away. How are we preparing our hearts to receive the word so that we might be obedient and bear fruit, bear fruit that glorifies God? Because the second takeaway that we must see is that believers are called to bear fruit. The greatest evidence of a heart that's changed, the greatest evidence of a heart that's prepared is that seed sprouts when the word of God is received, that it's born out in one's life and fruit follows. This does not mean that we're saved by works, right? We have to acknowledge that in the midst of this. This is not about action at its heart. It's not about that the evidence of somebody receiving God's word is the, the deeds, right, is the work they do. No, Jesus is acknowledging an overall spiritual truth that those who have received the word, those who have trusted in him, those who are submitted and surrendered to the gospel of the kingdom, meaning that they've trusted in Jesus Christ, he says they're going to bear fruit, right? Some, he says, a hundredfold, some 60, some 30, but they will bear fruit. Still, our hope only rests in Christ. 
Still only he is able to bring salvation to our souls. Still it is only the grace that he provides that brings us to salvation, restores us to fellowship with God, and then sets the stage and gives us strength to bear fruit in the midst of our lives. Right? It's only the work that he does that does that. It's not based on effort that we receive salvation or keep salvation, but don't miss that believers bear fruit. Those who surrender to Jesus demonstrated by their lives. And the truest sign of submission to him is seed that sown, grows, mature, matures, and bears fruit itself. And that's the calling of scripture, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Again, that's the reality that Jesus exposes in chapter 12 as he is wrestling against the Pharisees' unbelief. He says, make the tree bad and its fruit bad or make the tree good and its fruit good. He's saying because from a bad tree, you get what? Bad fruit. And from a good tree, you get good fruit. And so here, this whole picture of fruit that's born out is the reality of how we live, how the word is received. And the last thing I'll say in the midst of these takeaways is the one thing that we must see is that in all of that, what Jesus says, as he talks about the, the seed being sown, he talks about the word of God being given. Notice that the problem is not with the sower or the problem is not with the seed. The problem is with the soil. Let us not forget that and not miss that in the midst of our lives. Because our hearts can be an obstacle to submitting to the word of God. And so today my challenge and encouragement to you would be to weigh your own heart. To look at it, examine it. What's there? How do you receive the word of God? How has it been received in the midst of your life? What soil represents you? Represents your life? Wherever it's revealed that you are. Would you run to Jesus? Meaning that if you realize that you are suspect soil, run to him because he can change your heart. He can help you cultivate it to make it ready. He can help you receive it and surrender to him. And even if you're good soil, the only way that you stay that way is with the help and aid that Jesus gives. And so even if you would say today, I'm good soil, I'm ready for God's word, I want to obey and follow God's word, then thank him for it and ask him to continue to allow your heart to be good soil, to help you change it to be good soil. And the way that we do that is to stay in God's word. And so today it's all about how we receive the word. I pray that today that it would fall on good soil, that as your hearts have heard it, it would sprout, that it would grow, it would mature, and that it would bear fruit itself. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that as we look at your word, God, we see a picture of, Lord, where we might be ourselves. God, it was certainly true that in their day, Lord, there was uh, Lord, the challenge of their hearts not being surrendered. As we look at the Pharisees and their response, God, I pray that today we would not be in that place. That as we've heard the word, God, we have seen what it means for our lives. God, that we would respond in repentance today. God, that we would take you at your word and we would follow you. May our hearts be surrendered and submitted to you, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We ask you to stand with me. We wanna give you an opportunity to respond this morning. I just